I'm Vanessa King and I'm from the social movement Action for Happiness and I spend my time reviewing research studies on what makes us happy and helping people put those ideas into practice in their daily lives, in their workplaces and in their communities. Now imagine for a moment, if you would, a world where everyone knew the ingredients, the active ingredients in terms of what made us happier and put those into practice in their daily lives. Now, research shows that not only would they enjoy life more and be less prone to depression, but it's likely they'd be physically healthier. They'd be more engaged and productive at work. They're more likely to volunteer in their communities. They're more likely to be financially responsible. They even may be more likely to vote. Now, of course, many factors influence how happy we are. And some we can't change. We can't change our genes and our early upbringing, though some of us might try. Um, some factors we can influence with a bit of effort, um, like our external circumstances, our income levels, uh, the environment we live in. But once we reach a basic level in those, a moderate level of those, Trying to change those, changing those, has a relatively small impact on how happy we are. But how we think, our behaviour and our daily actions accounts for a significant proportion of how happy we feel. And that's really, really, really good news. Because those are the things that are more within our control to change. And having a sense of control in our lives is an absolutely fundamental ingredient in happiness. So, are you up for trying a couple of experiments? Yeah. Woo! <laughs> right, experiment one. Think back on your day yesterday. And I want you to bring to mind one or two things that you were pleased about. Um, or grateful for, or enjoyed. doesn't matter whether they were big or were really tiny, like getting a seat on the bus or somebody giving you a smile. Has everybody got something in mind? Great. Now, um, how does that feel when you reflect on that thing? How does it feel? Kind of nice, in a kind of warm, gentle sort of way? Well, it turns out that's not just a nice feeling. That's actually having a physiological and a psychological impact. Because when we're in a pleasant emotional state, it broadens our perceptual fields. We literally see more. We're more open to other people. We're more open to ideas. We're more open to information. We see more options. And little by little by little, that builds our, um, our psychological capacities. We form more connections with other people, we learn more, we're more flexible and can adapt more easily to change. And that builds our resilience. And did you invent, did anyone invent, have to invent something to think of? No, those good things happen. But we often let those things pass us by. Because in psychological terms, there's a phrase that's called, bad is stronger than the good. We are hardwired to notice what's wrong, and we, and we tend to experience unpleasant emotions much more strongly. So what this simple activity is, is, is it's a brain retraining exercise. It's enabling us to kind of squeeze more out of those positive moments. And when people were asked to do that, in, and this has been repeated in many studies, uh, when people were asked to write down at the end of each day, each night for a week, three things that they were enjoyed, were pleased about, three good things, and maybe a note or two on why they were good, maybe took a couple of minutes per day. Doing that each night for a week increased people's levels of happiness or psychological well-being that lasted for as long as six months. Not bad for just a tiny moment um, of time. Experiment two. You might want to close your eyes just for a brief moment. And I'm going to ask you to focus on your breath specifically on the air as it comes in through your nose and as it comes out 
through your nose. And just focus on that for a few seconds, a few rounds. And if your mind wanders, don't worry, just bring it back when you notice it's gone. So just breathing in, breathing out. How does that feel now? How do you feel now? You may open your eyes. <laughs> Everyone's gone to sleep. Um, you may open your eyes. Hopefully you felt a little tiny bit calmer, maybe a little bit more relaxed. And it's also a taster of what's called mindful awareness. And that's when we're in the present moment and we're aware of what's going on inside us perhaps and what's going on around us but we're not getting caught up in those thoughts. Because our minds wander about 50% of the time. And whether those are our minds wandering to something that's really pleasant or unpleasant, um, we're less happy when our, we tend to be less happy when our minds wander. So just by being able to anchor ourselves to our breath, not only can it help us become a little bit calmer, a little happier, and that's great for our well-being, it can also give us a bit more time in our day. What's not to like? And hopefully those two little tiny experiments can show how we have some control over our emotional um, state, even in the space of just a few minutes. And they're just a small fraction of what psychological research is showing that we can do to increase our happiness. And you may not be aware, but in the last two decades, there's been an absolute revolution in psychological research. Historically, psychology has focused on the causes and cures of dysfunction, which is very important, and that continues. But in the last two decades, there's been a much greater focus on what makes us happier and what enables us to flourish. So let's look at a few more, a taster of some of the other um, um, uh, sort of ideas that this research is revealing. Firstly, and this is a big, big, big thing for happiness, other people matter. Human beings are social creatures. We've evolved to live in social groups. So whether we are introvert or extrovert, we all need to feel connected to other people. And if we don't feel connected, if we feel lonely for prolonged periods of time, that can actually increase our chances of depression. And it can be as bad for our physical health as smoking or obesity. And one way, a great way of feeling connected to people, whether people close to us or complete strangers, is actually thinking about what we can do for, to other people. And it turns out, when we give to other people in some way, not only is it nice for them, but it's almost as if somebody, somebody has done something nice for us because it activates the reward centers in our brain, as if we were getting a gift, or reward of some kind. It activates those same, center, those same centers. So giving makes us happier. Happier people also tend to give more. So there's a kind of virtuous circle. If I help other people, I'm likely to be happier, and if I'm happier, I like, I'm more likely to ha help others. So it's a kind of social, you know, oils the social wheels, if you like. And of course, we can give in many ways. You know, we can give money if we've got some to spare. We can give time, we can give our skills, and we give a helping hand. And we can give a moment of thoughtful attention. And these are sometimes the, some of the most powerful ways, whether that's helping out a stranger in a the street who's struggling with a heavy bag or having a cup of tea ready when a loved one comes home and we know they've had a hard day. And sometimes those moments of thoughtfulness are some important ways of nurturing our closest relationships because often those are the ones we take most for granted. Exercise. We know it's good for our bodies, but what about our minds? John Ratey, who's a Harvard psychiatrist, and one of the world's experts in this area, describes aerobic activity as miracle grow for our brain. Because when we do um, get hot and sweaty for 20 minutes or so, uh, it literally stimulates brain cell production. We produce something called um, brain-derived neurotrophic growth factor, amongst other things, that help our brains become healthier. Kids who do aerobic activity before school have been shown to have improved academic performance. It helps adults think more clearly and effectively. Um, 
And it, this for me was a this was really a really really powerful awakening for me because um, I was at school I, I was put off exercise for life because I was always the last person to be picked for the sports teams and it, so um, each week it was like okay I'm being humiliated yet again um, and so I didn't do I didn't do any physical activity for years and when I came across this that moving more was good for your minds. I just thought I've got to got to try try this, and now it, it's an absolutely essential part of my my week um, to exercise because I know it helps me manage stress, and uh, and it, I know it makes me think more clearly. Yeah, you know, we can exercise our brains more directly as well because trying new experiences and learning, um, and being curious and following our interests, can be a rich source of enjoyment and fulfilment throughout our lives. And in fact, learning as we get older is um, a great way of keeping our brains functioning as we age. And trying new experiences can kind of expand our sense of time. And it can also feed our creativity. So uh, new ideas come from connecting seemingly disparate um, uh, uh, things in our minds. So the more diversity of stuff we've got in our brains and the more we learn, the more we've got to make connections with. So it fuels um, having creative ideas. Goals. Goals are how happiness happens, or so says Edwin Locke, who's a world expert on goals. And it's not just achieving goals, achieving our goals that actually influences happiness. It's the planning and working towards them too can be a sense of fulfillment. And it's not just big goals, but micro goals matter too. There's uh, research by Teresa Marble at Harvard Business School found that the, the thing that made the biggest difference between the best and the worst days at work were feeling a sense of progress. Now, how good does it feel when you tick something off your to-do list? Feels good. Yeah, and that's, that's an example. In fact, making a sense of progress is, again, a, a, a really important psychological need. Um, and psychology is also giving us lots of kind of hints and tips in terms of how to make working towards our goals and reaching our goals more likely. Do you know, as well as put, being very clear about what you need to do on your to-do list, if you visualize where think about where you will be and um, when you're doing going to do that thing you more than double your chance of, of reaching that goal pretty good huh productivity resilience now we all have ups and downs in life and being able to um, cope with those deal with those having ways to do that is an important part of happier living and everything we cover I'm covering today is an ingredient in resilience. But um, our thinking is especially important. And Will Shakespeare said, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And our th it's our thoughts that drive our emotions. But we may not realise that the case. But it's very often that we'll say, oh, God, he made me so angry. Oh, God, it made me feel so ashamed. But it's not the thing or the person that made us feel that way. It's our thought, our interpretation of perhaps why that happened um, or what will happen next. And the thing is, those interpretations happen so quickly that we may not know they're there and it, they can be inaccurate. In fact, they're often inaccurate. And we can fall into habits of thinking that really undermine our resilience. It's very, you know, for example, automatically assuming that everything's our fault, or the opposite, everything's somebody else's fault, or jumping to conclusions, or blowing things out of proportion. And if we can just pause for a moment when we get an emotional reaction and try and tune into what that interpretation is that we're making about what's happened, and just check its accuracy, that's the first step to kind of thinking more resiliently. Being comfortable with who you are. Every single person in this room, every single one of you, has things that you are energised by, you engage by, you learn quickly, you do naturally. And you have things that you don't. We all have strengths and weaknesses. And we're all different. And studies show that if we can identify what our strengths are, and use those more and in new ways, 
it not only makes us happier, um, it can make us healthier and make us more effective at work. Um, and it doesn't mean to say we shouldn't focus on our weaknesses, but we only focus on those to the extent they're holding us back from using our strengths, because we'll get more energy and more happiness from using our strengths. And studies have shown that when people um, use a strength in a new way, um, each day for a week, um, that increased their levels of happiness, and it grew over a period of six months, and decreased their um, display of depression-type symptoms. In fact, Martin Seligman, who's um, the father of this shift in psychology, this revolution in psychology I talked about, describes strengths as um, our biggest, the biggest potential we have to contribute to the world and achieve well-being. And contributing, feeling that we and what we do contributes to something bigger and beyond ourselves, is indeed an important ingredient in happiness. Having a sense of meaning um, matters for both well-being and resilience. And having several sources of meaning can, can help. Um, can, it can help with resilience. But finding meaning isn't always easy. Uh, we can start giving by and helping other people is a great place to start if we're struggling with what meaning. And I like to encourage people to think about their footprint because this can give us real clues as to what meaning means to us in our lives. So what footprint do you want to leave today, this week, the next year, for the rest of your life? And that gives clue clearing a uh, clues to what meaning we mean to you. So myself and my colleagues at Action for Happiness have distilled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of research papers into what we call our 10 keys to happier living. We've touched on each of these actually throughout this talk. It's a menu, it's not a prescription. What works for each of us is different and we need different things at different times. And there'll be things you're already doing, so it kind of helps to know what's making a difference so you can maintain those. And you may have spotted that the acronym for these is Great Dream. And it's our dream that this framework, these 10 keys, will inspire you to take action for yourself and for other people. And our dream goes beyond that. Our dream is bigger. Because I believe these 10 keys can help us shape our communities. They can help shape our schools. They can help shape our workplaces. They can help shape the physical environment that we live in. They've already been starting to be used at schools and in other ways. And I even use them to build a case as to why the local libraries in my area, the little community libraries, should be kept open when they were threatened with closure. And we won, we won, it helped um, people believe, because these are all, evi all evidence-based. So I hope you'll share our great dream and take action for yourselves and the world around you. And at the end of today, why not start with experiment one and write down your three things that were good from today? Because that's one step towards this dream. Thank you.